Sounded all right, huh? Like it happened that way, Mike. I was working on that slob with the club members when you came in. I don't think you can save much of that. It's too choppy, you know? Well, maybe the first two pieces will be enough. Oh, you want to hear the piece from Fuller's wife? Fine. Good. Here's your coffee, Mr. Jackson. You take it. You got an expense account. Here you are, Bobby. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Oh, here it is. The one thing that makes it easier for the boys and myself is the knowledge that all of you share some of our grief. As long as there are friends and listeners who remember the happiness and joy he brought into their lives, he isn't really dead. That's a wonderful kind of immortality for him. It'll play. Like the seventh game of the World Series. Say, did you know I used to be Fuller's engineer? No. Two years. <laughs> what a liberal education that was. How was Eddie Brand? Heart rendering. Eddie was robbing him deaf, dumb, and blind. He was on the payroll of every song plugger in town. Every time you heard a tune on Fuller's program, you could chalk up another 25 bucks in Eddie's pocket. Of course, everybody in the show was doing that job. It works like this. It's a hot day. So it's natural to say that you've uh, stuck your head in the refrigerator. But if you say refrigerator or icebox, it's just a piece of copy. But if you mention the brand name, it's a case of scotch. Fuller was on the grab, too. The difference was he stole big. I uh, see you got to know our Carol. You heard the tapes, huh? I heard it. It was in a box without a label on it. I don't think there's anything in it you can use on the air. Hi. Blood plasma stories, Mike. The yeah, others just miscellaneous stuff, dogs, home life, and so on. Anything happened while I was out? Carlton's secretary called. Just a minute. He wants to see you at 9 o'clock in his office tomorrow morning. It's for you, Joan. I had your calls transferred. Hello? Mr. Harris, please. Speaking. This is Paul Beasley of Worcester. Yes, Mr. Beasley. I'm in the building up here on the 10th floor visiting Mr. Cutler. I can be down in your office in a couple of minutes. Well, that's fine, Mr. Beasley. Just why would you want to do that? This is Joe Harris, isn't it? Yes, and this is Paul Beasley, isn't it? That's correct. Of Worcester? Correct. Just a minute. Jenny, do I know a Paul Beasley? Beasley? Uh, Mr. Beasley, would you mind telling me just what it is you want to talk to me about? I own station WGHP in Worcester. I don't want to sound rude, Mr. Beasley, but so what? You are Joe Harris, aren't you? Jenny, will you please tell this man that I'm Joe Harris? He is Joe Harris. Convinced? Good. I didn't now, will you please have someone at your end vouch for the fact that you're Paul Beasley? Oh, that's perfectly ridiculous. Right. Mr. Harris, I didn't doubt you. That was Paul Beasley. Of Worcester. Mike, why don't you start isolating the blood bank tapes? I'll run in on you later. I think I'll go down to the restaurant and get something to eat. I'm starving to death. I'm dead tired. You're tired. You haven't spent 15 hours a day listening to what a heel the guy you've got to glorify really was. The feet of clay, huh? Right up to the knees, at least. You mind if I conk off for a while? Conk. Yes? Mr. Harris? Yes? Mr. Joe Harris? That's right. I just... I just spoke to you on the phone from Mr. Cutler's office, the regional representative for the New England area. Paul. Paul Beasley. What a surprise after all these years. Well, I'm afraid you're making some sort of a mistake there. You're not Paul Beasley? You mean I've mistaken you for my good friend Paul Beasley? Impossible. You're not Paul Beasley? Oh, yes, I am Paul Beasley. That's what I said, Paul Beasley of Worcester, Mass. We never met, you know, Mr. Harris. You are Mr. Harris, aren't you? Jenny? He is Joe Harris. And my secretary. Oh. How do you do? How do you do? Excuse me. Well, Mr. Beasley? You're probably wondering what I'm doing here. As a matter of fact, what are you doing here, Paul? Didn't you get the ten grand I left in the hollow tree? Oh, you're joking, Mr. Harris. I'm joking, Mr. Beasley. I thought so. It is true that you're doing the Herb Fuller Memorial Show on Friday night. Right. I gave Herb his first job in radio. You gave Herb Fuller his first radio job? That's right. Well, you know, Mr. Beasley, I've been talking to a lot of people that knew Herb Fuller very well. 
Uh, sit down. You might help fill in some of the gaps. Oh, not so fast, Mr. Harris. I'm a businessman. You know, I, I might have something that you want. I don't expect to make you a present of it. You want a little dough, is that it? Of course I don't want any money. I'm afraid you misunderstand me. I'm trying not to. Now, just what do you want? Our call letters, WGHP, stand for something. Stand for something very close to our hearts. Mrs. Beasley's and mine, I mean. They stand for, with God's help, peace. W-G-H-P. And I just wondered if you'd try to get those call letters into your broadcast and explain them. It might do a lot of good. I'll try. Now, when did you first meet Herb Fuller? Oh, in uh, 1933. He came in to audition for one of our programs. It was a sort of an amateur hour, but it had an extra added ingredient. The contestant not only had to perform, but he had to deliver a two-minute sermon. Now, our listeners phoned in their votes, and the content of the sermon counted as much as the talent of the performer. Herbert was in the Navy then, and he came down from Boston one night to audition for the program. What did he do? He sang. And how did he make up? He won first prize. But it was the salmon that won the contest for him. It was good? We got over 500 requests for it. Do you remember what it was like? That's what decided me about this trip. When I read of Herbert's death, I remembered that salmon of his, and I thought it might be of some use to you. It might indeed. The best sermon I know has no words, none at all. I hear it at night when my ship is out at sea. Out under the lonely stars, separated from the world by a limitless void of water. And one night I got to wondering out under those stars what God was really like. What he looked like. How I'd know him if I ever saw him. And the answer was so simple, my friends. So simple. The answer was that they were all God. The stars and the night, the silence and the lapping of the water. And I wouldn't have any trouble recognizing him when I saw him because he was everywhere around me, in everything I heard, everything I said, everything I saw. God was the sum total of all of us. And it makes you wonder, it really does, how can man be so small and so insignificant and at the same time be so great and so wonderful? Uh, by the way, Mr. Beasley, you don't still happen to have a recording of that show, do you? The same thought occurred to me. I didn't have the time to look through the storeroom. But I'm sure it's there somewhere. Mrs. Beasley's funny about things like that. She just can't throw anything away. You know, Mr. Harris, in a great many ways, Herbert was not a very nice man. In a great many ways, he was a very bad man. How do you mean? Mr. Harris, I realize in the eyes of a lot of people, I'm faintly ridiculous. I can't help that. I don't think I'm ridiculous. My friends don't think so. Mrs. Beasley doesn't think so. I don't mind that slight smile that always round people's mouths when they talk to me. Truly, I don't. I noticed it on you, Mr. Harris. I don't mind. But there is one thing I do mind, Mr. Harris. I mind very much. I don't like to be taken advantage of. Herbert took advantage of me. How? After he won that amateur contest, he was the talk of Worcester. It sounds silly, doesn't it? The talk of Worcester. Anyway, I hired him. Six months later, when he got out of the Navy, I gave him a program of two hours length in the morning of his own. And right from the start, he began including a little sermon in his broadcast every day. Of course, it's simple to use hindsight now and realize that he figured if that's what they wanted, he could certainly give it to them. He had found a good thing and he was auditioning it in Worcester. An out-of-town tryout, huh? Trying it on the door, Mr. Harris. Mr. Beasley, I don't find you the least bit ridiculous. Well, people don't after a while. Anyway, Herbert was very successful. Oh, we had more sponsors on his program than all the other programs on the station. <laughs> 